The Bible is God speaking to me. I am what the Word of God says I am. I can do what the Word of God says I can do. I have what the Word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. My mind is renewed with the Word. Therefore, I'm thinking those thoughts that please my Father. I'm walking by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah and amen. Let's open up our Bibles to Mark chapter 11. Mark the 11th chapter. Your Bibles ought to just flop open to it. You've been in this ministry any length of time because... We cover this as a foundational scripture, in particular when we talk about the subject of faith. And we will be talking about faith, how it operates as a law. Faith operates as a law. Now, when we say faith operates as a law, well, the subject is faith, but the understanding of its operation is that because it operates as a law, the word law means that it's going to function irrespective of emotions. It's going to function irrespective of opinions. Faith operates as a law. And since it operates as a law, anyone who cooperates with faith will get results with faith. Faith is oftentimes used in a understanding of denomination. In other words, people say, well, what faith uh, are you talking about? Are you talking about a Episcopalian? Are you talking about Lutheran? Are you talking about Baptist, Catholic, Seventh-day Adventist? Are you talking about uh, Nazarene? When you say faith, are you talking about a denominational persuasion? No. We're talking about a law that truly exists that God put into the earth realm so that we as believers can function in it. Now, why would God put faith in the earth realm? Because he operates by faith and everything God does, he does it by faith. And you and I, as believers in Christ Jesus, are required to operate in faith in order to get results from heaven. Faith operates as a law, and because it operates as a law, we as believers in Christ Jesus must be aware that faith is not impacted by emotions. So even if you don't feel like faith is or does work, it doesn't matter because faith operates as a law like electricity operates as a law. Now, this is the reason why in Mark, the 11th chapter, Jesus, we'll look at verse 12, Mark chapter 11, verse 12. Jesus was talking about why it's so important for his disciples to understand faith because he wanted them to produce results because he was bringing forth the word for people to operate by the God kind of faith. And certainly he wanted his disciples to understand how the God kind of faith worked. Mark chapter 11, beginning at verse 12. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. And it says here, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Which, if you read the word yet, you see that it's italicized, and it gives the impression that Jesus didn't know the seasonal operations of a tree, of that particular tree, which was a fig tree. Well, he was familiar with the operations of fig trees. In fact, the tree was supposed to have figs on it if the leaves were green. And 
Therefore, he came with an expectation of what would normally be the situation. So it was an anomaly or it was an oddity that the fig tree didn't have any figs on it. And verse 14, and Jesus answered and said unto it, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now we know that in the Gospels that there is an example of the farmer who's looking for fruit from a tree and the tree is not producing any fruit and he says dig it out and let's uh, get rid of it. It's taking up room in the ground where we could have a tree that produces fruit. And his servant said, well, let's give me a little more time to work with it. I'll fertilize it around and give it more attention. Perhaps it will produce fruit. So having fruit from a tree was a reasonable expectation. And a tree that does not bear fruit is something that is not to be taken lightly because it's taking up room from a potential yielding tree that can produce fruit. So that means we are looking at Jesus expressing his concern for this tree that does not produce fruit. So we all as believers in Christ Jesus could say this, Jesus expects fruit. Jesus has desires in his heart for us. Jesus wants us to produce fruit. And therefore, as he spoke to the fig tree, the disciples were able to hear his disappointment and they heard the entirety of what he said regarding the tree at the time. And it said, he said this, and Jesus answered and said unto it, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. Now, when we hear Jesus make this statement, notice that he speaks from the observation of knowing that the tree is not producing fruit to the end of the tree's life. He said, no man shall eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. What does that mean? That means the tree is done. He made a judgment concerning the tree, and the judgment he made about the tree is that nobody will be bothered by this tree expecting fruit from this tree. This tree will not give a false evidence of it could have fruit, but it will not have fruit because it is a non-fruit-bearing tree because of its oddity. Then Jesus said, Nobody else is going to go through this. No man will eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, meaning that this tree is over with and done. Now, as we read the rest of the scripture, notice that since he said the tree is not going to be able to bear fruit hereafter, or no man shall eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, and his disciples heard it, notice that faith sees the answer before it's visible. I'll say that again. Faith sees the answer or the end before it's visible. So as he moves forward in his day's activity, they went into the city and then they came out of the city in verse 20 of Mark chapter 11. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the, the fig tree, not a fig tree, but the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. Now Jesus is not deflecting Peter's concern or what Peter was noticing and vocalizing. Jesus was bringing a lesson to Peter and to us and all of the disciples about how these results came to pass. And it's relative or it is imperative that we see how the fig tree experience 
ties into the disappointment of what Jesus went through in the temple when he went into the temple expecting to have prayer and people having a wonderful fellowship with God through his word, his promises, through his covenant with them, and they were disappointed because the environment was such that people who had no faith and who were crooked and who had ill proper me, uh, motives, they seemed to be very comfortable in not having results with God because they were not purposing to have God have his way in the lives of his people. So Jesus said, my house shall be known of all nations as a house of prayer or called of all nations as a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And so when he said den of thieves, that means these individuals that are here sucking up the air that are not trying to receive any results with God, that are not trying to change the lives of the people to have a better life in God and in their covenant with him, these individuals are literally are fruitless or they are non-bearing fruit. They're, they're, they're not producing any fruit at all for people to have a better life, to have an interaction with God, for God to move on their behalf through the prayer of faith. Consequently, Jesus acknowledged what was going on, and he was extremely disappointed with it. We could say it this way. God intends for his people to desire or to have desires to want things, to have an expectation for better. So you can write in your notes, God expects me to have a desire for better. And when you hang around God, when you fellowship with God, when you commit to walking with the Lord, you're going to start desiring better. You don't get disappointed at things and say that, well, I guess nothing will get better. You will start developing a heart or a desire for better. Why? Because when you become acquainted with God, who is your father, you come to know that he makes things better. Better. And he operates by law. And his power that he has used to make the earth and that he's used to make vegetation and things operate, those things operate because God released his faith when he made trees and made them to have seeds in them to bring forth more trees. So God has desired that his people understand that they should have a desire for better. Everybody say better. Better. Now, how can we have a desire for better? Because God has already made the law of faith or faith, he's already made faith available for people, but faith has to be cooperated with. Faith has to be understood or should be understood. And faith has to be what? Employed or faith has to be released. Faith has to be put into operation. For example, in my home, I have electricity. If I want lights on in my home, I have to flip the switch for lights. Some of you that have smart homes, you can say, turn on the lights and the lights will come on through voice activation. My point being is you have to make a quality decision. You have to do something to change the circumstance by what? By expressing your desire. You got to express your desire. And the thing about it, when you have people around you that have no desire, or if you have people that have no understanding of faith who do not want to uh, uh, take the, the time to investigate what faith will do and can do, those individuals get angry with those who want things through faith. Like blind Bartimaeus' friends 
Some people say, well, Bartimaeus received his eyesight. He did. How did he receive his eyesight? By faith. But what about his friends that kept trying to get him to be quiet? They lost their desire. And when I say friends, his compadres, the people that were around him, his companions that were blind, because they oftentimes traveled together as a cluster of blind people, they didn't want him to be noticed, and they didn't want him to express a desire above what they were used to, what they were used to. Faith is the law. Bartimaeus said, I want to have the lights of my eyes turned on. I want to have sight. When they were thinking, hey, you're blind. Just accept the fact that you're blind. Let it go. Leave it alone. Just keep the status quo. But Bartimaeus said, I want to see. I know that other people can see. I want to see. He's expressing what he desires, and his desire is going to be met with a response from God because Bartimaeus is going to operate in the law of faith. Now let's look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. 6 and 27, because when we say faith operates as a law, that means gravity is a law. And Newton talked about how that you can have an apple to fall from a tree that he was sitting under, if you've heard the story of Isaac Newton, how that a tree bopped him on the head as he was sitting there getting off, you know, getting some understanding of something he was meditating or thinking about. And the apple hit him and he thought, well, if I was in another part of the world, would the apple fall down or would it fall up? Well, he came to the conclusion that apples will fall down from the tree all over the world because there is something in the earth realm called gravity. And gravity is a law. It can be explained through observation. You can, co you can co cooperate with gravity. What if all the basketball players went to dribble a ball and the ball, instead of going down, went up? It would end their career. And they make their comfortable living out of the law of gravity operating on the ball and their ability to run down the court and their ability to supersede, or it looks like they're superseding gravity, when they can leap off of the hardwood floor and put the ball into a hoop with the net at a level where other people, everybody, can't just do that without operating in special abilities. So hence we have that Bartimaeus recognized that since people do see, and I know people see, then I want to see, and I will not be denied. Bartimaeus said, I'm going to allow faith to change my life. Now, we're looking at Romans chapter 3, verse here, verse 26 and 27. To declare, I say this at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That means everybody who believes in Jesus has received him as their Lord and Savior. God said, I have justified you, and I am just in justifying you. Therefore, as a believer, I who believe on Jesus, I can say this. God treats me just as if I'd, how'd you like that? Just as if I'd justified, just as if I'd never sinned. He looks at me without disappointment. He looks at me without wanting me to have shame. I'm justified. That means I stand before the presence of God without any sense of fear, without any sense of inferiority, without any sense of shame. I am justified before God because I'm perfect? No, because I believe in Jesus. 
Now, because I believe in Jesus, God says, I'm just in calling you justified, Gary. And when you make your request, don't you feel ashamed or think that you're not entitled to your request being answered because, Gary, you are justified. And when you know that you're justified, that does something to your 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 faith. It does something to your expector. I'll call it that. When you have a way of identifying that you can expect or you can desire something, your desire capacity increases when you know that God, who has justified you, says, what is it that you desire? You're justified. You're righteous. You are made right with me, not because you're perfect, but because of Jesus' perfection and because you believe on him, you've obeyed what I said to do by believing on him. So even though you are not perfect, you can be confident that I see you as perfect in my son. Now, what does that do to your capacity to gain confidence and to start having a desire? Well, if God is rich, and he is rich, he has made the world and everything in it. He made the cattle that dwell upon the hills. He made the hills that the cattle dwell upon. God made the earth and the fullness thereof. The gold is his and the silver is his. Then why would I go through life lacking when my father, who I'm in good fellowship with and relationship with, why would I go without when daddy says, ask me, and I'll grant it unto you. Do you understand now why Jesus was so angry when he went into the temple? Because instead of the people having a experience of receiving from God by having faith, they were stymied or they were oppressed or they were put given a position where they were having a lid or a limit on them through what? Through lack of faith. Well, then how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When the word of God is taught, information is imparted. And when information is imparted, you can begin to make decisions on the basis of what you now know. Jesus went into the temple and nobody was teaching on faith. Nobody was. But Jesus was already teaching on faith before he went into the temple when he approached the fig tree, had a desire for the fig tree to have fruit. The fig tree did not give him what he desired. Instead of calling it, let's just leave it cool and keep the status quo, no, he spoke to the situation of the fig tree by exercising his faith. He released his words on the fig tree, and the fig tree had a response to the word. It died. It dried up even from its roots. Peter calling to remember and say, Lord, look at this. And Jesus was explaining that you ought to have the God kind of faith. Why? Because as people who are walking with the Lord, you should be well acquainted with him through his word, and his word is filled with exceeding great and precious promises that by these you would be a partaker of his divine nature. It means Jesus said, what I have done, you can do. Exercise your faith. It's necessary that you see faith as operating by a law and not by an emotion or a feeling. What if the pilot of the airplane says, well, I don't feel like this plane can fly today? Well, that, what does that have to do with anything? Your technical knowledge of aeronautics, of lift and thrust, and uh, gravity and how, how the airplane maneuvers through clouds and, and wind gusts and so forth, and the symmetry of the plane. I don't care how you feel. The question is, are you going to fly this plane? 
because your feelings don't factor into operating with what I know will produce results. So when we're going to, what we're going to read here in Psalms 37, we're going to do something that we can be informed about. And if we apply with what we're being told and informed about, we'll be able to get results even if in the natural, when I say natural, your past experiences uh, and attempts and lack of understanding didn't produce results for you. You say, well, you know, I, didn't, I tried to get the plane to fly before it didn't fly. Well, that's not, a, that's not the plane's problem. It is not that planes can't fly. It's just that you did not do what was necessary to allow the plane to do what it was designed to do, given the forces and laws that are in existence. All right, let's look at Psalms 37, verse 1. Number 1, verse 1 of Psalms 37, verse 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. So the first thing he says is don't you allow yourself to become filled with anxiety, worry, fret. Don't you become unforgiving because of evildoers. And don't you start being envious of people that look like they got it going on when you know good and well they're doing wrong. Don't let it bother you to the point where you become agitated and forgetful that you can fly your plane. You can operate in faith and get results. So don't be fretful. Verse 2 of Psalms 37. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Verse 3. Trust in the Lord. Underline that, highlight that, remember that. Trust in the Lord. Now, how does one trust in the Lord? You can only trust in the Lord from what you know of the Lord. You can't trust what you've never been informed about. So if you have trust in the Lord, that is an indication that you have what? heard something about the Lord and you chose to grab a hold of it and to hold fast to it and to govern your decisions and your speech and your actions by it. Like, for example, the song. I love this song and I, I would really, really love to bring maybe an updated version of the song and, and have it to be more popular. But have you ever heard the song, Yes, Jesus Loves Me? Yes, Jesus Loves Me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Have you ever heard that song before? Well, how do you know Jesus loves you? The answer is in the song. It says, because the Bible tells me so. The information that they receive from the Bible allows for them to have a confidence that Jesus loves me, not because I feel like it, not because, you know, uh, the weather pattern says so, but it's because the Bible tells me so. And this is what the Bible says in Psalms 37, verse 3. Trust in the Lord. That means have confidence and what you know from the Lord. Now, how are you going to know something from the Lord? You're going to have to know it from the Bible. And do good. Well, how do you know what good is? You know what good is because the Bible tells you what is good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily, which means faithfully or truly, Thou shalt be fed. That means you're going to be well supplied. Now, let's take a look at this and examine how God is leading his people through his word to understand that they should function in life by the law of faith. Their confidence should be in what God says because if you walk according to the word, you'll walk by faith, not by sight, or we could say it this way, you will fly through life instead of trying to gut it out and walk only on the ground. 
He said here, and verily thou shalt be fed. He goes on to say in verse 4 of Psalms 37, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. So somebody says, well, how do you come to a place where things get better? Another way of saying better is to say, how can I start having desires that make improvement? The desires come from what we see in verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires or the want to, the ability to reach out and have hope. Hope is a confident expectation of a better future. Or you just start knowing that things can be better than the way they are. Where does that better desire come from? He says here, when you start delighting yourself in the Lord, you're going to start wanting better. Now, does that mean you're dissatisfying and complaining about what you got? No. It's just that when you delight yourself in the Lord, these, these desires or these prompts or these yearnings begin to rise up from your heart and you'll start wanting things and those things that you want will come from him putting it in you. Now, why would he give you desires? Because then he can fulfill those desires. And when he fulfills the desires and you start having a better life, other people are wondering, how are you doing this? You got to give the credit to the Lord because you have delighted yourself in him. Let's go back to Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus did what? Bartimaeus didn't just yell out, hey, I want to get some eyesight from somebody. Even though he was used to begging as a, as a beggar, he had a license to beg because he was a blind man and he had cloaks or covering or attire that identified him as a beggar and therefore Bartimaeus had a certain lifestyle, but Bartimaeus had a desire for what? For better. For better. And when you have a desire for better, what happens? You're going to have better if you operate in the law of faith and you say, Lord, I have delighted myself in you. I know this about you and your character. And this on the inside of me, I just know that you give sight. And since you give sight, when Bartimaeus started screaming out and calling for Jesus, Again, he's calling out for Jesus. Who's he talking to? Jesus. His friends try to discourage him and put a cap on him, put a lid on him. Be okay with the status quo. You got a certain lifestyle. Be just satisfied with that Bartimaeus. No, Jesus. He cried even more the louder. Why? Because he's going after Jesus, who's called Lord, who is called the word of God in the flesh, Emmanuel. When you delight yourself in the Lord, he, he tuned everybody else out and tuned Jesus in. And this is, I'm giving you the keys to flight. I'm helping you to understand the laws of aeronautics in the scriptures regarding faith. You wonder how it is that some believers seem to be producing such great results with their faith. It is because the more you delight yourself in the Lord, 
you will have desires that will begin to come forth inside of you. Why? Because God gives them to you. Why? Because there's none greater than God. And God desires to do in your life above and beyond what you could ask or think. Therefore, he gives you an insight as to what he wants for you. And then you can begin to say, now, Lord, I ask you for it. And I believe you heard me. Thank you very much. And parao, he produces it. Well, why do, I, why do I have to ask God for it? Because God set up this earth to function under the authority of man. He gave man dominion to operate in the earth realm. And that's why Jesus said, Thy will, O Lord, be done on earth as it is in heaven. He wants us to request God's will to be done on earth. Well, how do you know what God's will is that's taking place in heaven? You have to delight yourself in the word of God. And the more you get into the word, the more you understand how God functions and operates. The more you understand how heaven works. You can see the clarity of how heaven and its citizens that are in Christ Jesus, those that have gone before you in the Lord, you know that when you get to heaven, there's nobody in heaven committing murder. There's nobody in heaven ripping off. There's nobody in heaven lying. There's nobody in heaven trying to do wrong and evil. That's not going on in heaven. The person that was responsible for all that evil stuff was kicked out of heaven, and his name is the devil. And he's operating in the earth realm. That's why in Matthew, the sixth chapter, he talks about deliver us from evil. Why? Because evil is not God's will for his people. Goodness is God's will for his people. And that's why Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have life, how? More abundantly. Notice he said, delight thyself in the Lord. So what I determined is that I'm just going to get happy about the word. I'm getting into the word. I don't need anybody to try to encourage me to get in the word. I'm not saying this Anything wrong with someone says, hey, let's get into the word. I'm just saying I don't have to have somebody to tell me to delight myself in the word because I found out from Psalms 37, if I delight myself in the Lord, he will give me the desires of my heart. And I know that the more I keep delighting in his promises, the more I keep having these desires and these desires that I have are very clear cut and and focused and very easy to understand and are achievable by him responding to my request according to what I've seen in his word. Now, have any of you ever heard of Adam and Eve? Yes. Who did God make first? Adam. And then God said, it's not good for man to be alone. Let's turn over and let's look at that together. Look at this in Genesis chapter 2. It's not good for man to be alone, he said. So if it's not good for man to be alone, why does he acknowledge that? Uh, Genesis chapter 2. It is because God wants good to be in the place of what is not good. Or we could say it this way, God wants better. He wanted better for Adam than what Adam even knew himself. But when you delight yourself in the Lord, when you spend time kicking it with God, when you spend time in the word and you get to fellowship with the Lord, what happens? You start getting desires because your desires are coming from the Lord. When you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. And when Adam heard God say this, look in uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. He didn't say man was lonely. He said alone, which means just me and him kicking it. There's something better that I have for him. So everybody say better is good <laughs> and good is better. All right. So and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help mate for him. 
Who's God talking to? He's talking to the Son. He's talking to the Holy Ghost. God is talking to the Godhead, which he is God the Father. He was talking to God the Son. He was talking to God the Holy Ghost about what he had in it, in God's heart for his son, Adam. Verse 19. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. Uh, beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof. Why? Because Adam is operating as God in the earth realm and what he says he releases his faith on and that's the way it is. Verse 20. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found, underline or highlight the word found, there was not found and help meet for him. Why do you have to use the word find? It is because now Adam is searching. Why is Adam searching for a helpmate, an able helper? Because by fellowshipping with God, he started developing these desires. What was his desire? His desire was to have a helpmate. Where'd that desire come from? It came from him hanging out with God, delighting himself in the Lord. He knew that, hey, hey, you know something? Even though I'm here with you, Lord, I've got this yearning. I have this desire. I have this wanting for someone else. What is this coming from? It's coming from the Lord God, his Father. When you hang out with God, you start having yearnings and desires. And those yearnings and desires that you have from God will be right and will be good and will be a blessing because God intended that man would have what God made man for, which is to be fruitful and to multiply and replenish the earth. Verse 21, notice here the verse 20 of the end of verse 20 of Genesis chapter 2. But for Adam, there was not found an helpmate for him. That means he was seeking. And it's interesting that if you seek, you'll what? Find. If you knock, the door will be open. If you ask, you'll receive. Verse 21. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Isn't it interesting how the Adam called her a woman because she's a man, but she's not a man as he is. She is a man with a womb. She has the capacity to do something that he recognized that God gave it to her in creating her. She's a man with a womb. And therefore, she's man, but she's different than he is because she's capable of doing something that she can do that he can't do. And what is that? She can bring forth life out of her womb where Adam does not have a womb outside of the woman. He has to have a woman. This is some really good instruction here. And so therefore, a man that findeth a wife, not a girlfriend, a man that findeth a wife, not a friend with benefits, a man that findeth a wife, findeth a good thing in favor with the Lord. And notice this, that when Adam saw her, he said, Woo, man, I love it. That means Adam was totally accepting of her and he knew what her capabilities were because his father gave her to him and God does not give you anything without a set of instructions that come with it. He had it downloaded in him. He knew what her purpose was. How do you know? Verse 23 and 24 of Genesis chapter 2. 
23 says, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother. What do you know about mother, Adam? You don't have a mother. God is your father. Adam understands the structure of a family because it came to him from God by revelation. And Adam is describing the function of a family that will come forth. He's calling it forth. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh, which means they will be intimate and they'll produce in marriage, verse 25, and they were both naked the man and his wife, the man and his wife, notice the title, wife, what's the title, wife mean? Wife. Why didn't he say the man and his woman? The man and his what? Wife. They were married. Well, wait a minute, doesn't, doesn't the marriage take place in a ceremony? Doesn't the marriage take place in a covenant? Doesn't the marriage happen with witnesses? Yes. Adam was a witness, Eve was a witness, God was a witness, and even the angels of heaven were witnesses. Are you getting this? He was married. And in this marriage, it is a, it is a covenant. And in a covenant, there's full exposure. In a covenant, there is an understanding that what happens to you happens to me. What happens to me happens to you. And there is an understanding of our roles, our positions, because our positions came from God who enables us to do what he made us capable of doing. No human man, I'm not talking about woman, no human man can have a baby. I don't care how much they may try to describe it. I'd like to, uh, no, 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 you don't want to. <laughs> you really don't. You may want to multiply, and that desire to multiply comes from God. But you don't want, a, there is no man I've ever met that wants a baby to come through his anatomy. Have you ever met a man that wants a baby to come through their anatomy? Has anybody, anybody, no? Why? They were not, men were not made to have a baby come through their body. In fact, God put Adam to sleep just to get a rib. <laughs> he put him to sleep. Why? He didn't want to give up the rib. <laughs> Who knows? He may have wanted to give up the rib, but God put, performed the first operation on him. And here's the thing, but a woman can have a baby, and in having a baby, it's, to me, it's like the, it's a concept, it's an ability, it's a law of life that a woman can have a baby that I have to just trust God and be an observer of what women can do. A woman having a baby is like a foreign planet to a man. He can't have a baby. He had to go to sleep to get a woman. How much more would he be mesmerized if he had to have a baby come through his body? Can't do it. It's a whole nother level. Therefore, as man and woman, they should respect and honor one another and enjoy each other's ability. And there, here's the thing about it. A woman desires to have a baby. Men really don't desire to have a baby. But men do have this desire which comes from the Lord. I didn't get married to see what I could take from my wife. I got married to have someone to love in this life. God loves me, and he delights in me. And by me having a wife, I love God. And therefore, this desire to want to pour my love on someone is a what? Um, the Bible says, a man that findeth a wife findeth a good thing in favor with the Lord. And then my wife and I love each other so much by loving God so much that my wife allows for me and her to agree. And we have children. And the children that we have, we both now are allowed to agree to love on our children. 
to express love on our children. That's a godly thing. That's a good thing. How do you take care of children? By faith. How do you know their needs will be met? By faith. How do you know they're going to be a success? By faith. How do you know that they're going to live their lives delighting in God and having their desires met? By faith. I have to use words of faith to build strong children that will make life better for my home, better for my neighborhood, better for my city, better for my state, better for my nation, better for my world. I believe that things are getting better. And we have generations that we input the word of God into them so that they can believe better. How do you know humanity will continue to exist? Because God released his faith and said, let them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And when God said that, the capacity for that to happen is still operating in the earth realm. Therefore, we operate according to the scriptures, delighting ourselves in the Lord, in his word, and he gives us the desires of our heart. How do I know that the things can be received and made better? How did Bartimaeus know he could receive his sight? Because Jesus had already proclaimed where he went, proclaimed the places that he was, that he was visiting in his traveling ministry. He said, I am anointed to give sight to the blind. Bartimaeus heard that. And he knew. I'm blind and I qualify to receive from your anointing to give sight to the blind. Now, my friends may not want that. They may not have heard that. They may not desire that. But Bartimaeus desired it because he delighted in what Jesus preached. And Jesus said, Bartimaeus, according to your faith, be it unto you. And I'm saying to all Christians all over the world, delight yourself in the word of God and let, let, let the desire of God's word rise up within you and then operate in faith according to his word in you. And you will have a life that has no limits, a good life. Salvation is the free gift that the Lord offers anyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10 that with our hearts we believe unto righteousness and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. I trust that you will believe God's word, that your faith will be in the risen Savior who came to give his life for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Will you pray with me this prayer of salvation? It's not difficult. It's very easy, but you must mean it from your heart. So repeat these words after me. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. With my mouth, I confess you and I receive you as my Savior. Jesus, thank you for making my heart your home. Thank you for living in me. God the Father is now my Father, and the Holy Spirit has done a work in me. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, and thank you for guiding my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to be a blessing to you at Spirit Food Christian Center. The way this broadcast is brought to you is by people's faithful sowing and reaping as a result of God's word being given unto them. So I want to encourage you, be a part of this ministry of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this ministry, we believe that man must hear the word of God. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. 
the Bible declares, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God loves a cheerful and hilarious giver. I encourage you, be a part of this ministry. Be hilarious in your giving and watch the Lord bring it back to you in many, many ways. In Jesus' name. You have been watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast online at www.myspiritfood.com. Join us for worship service each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And be sure to check out our website for our weekly live broadcast and much, much more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.